hey, this is so random, but you should really learn how to properly generate random values in Unity's Entity Component System. And that is exactly what I'm going to be showing you in today's video. Today we're going to be going over how to use the Unity's Random Struct, which is part of the Unity.Mathematics library, and we can use it to generate random values in Unity's Entity Component System. It's a really cool and easy way to generate random numbers. There's some nice features on it, um, but there are some pitfalls that you need to be aware of. So we're going to be going over that today. Basically, going to be going over how it works. I'm going to be showing you how to actually implement it. I'm going to be showing you some of the incorrect things that you might do when you're implementing it and how to avoid those. And if you stick it through all the way to the end, I'm going to give you a little bonus tip that's going to show you how to use some uh, nice clean code principles in Unity's Entity Component System. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Anyways, if you do find today's video helpful, I'd really appreciate if you hit that like button. Also, feel free to subscribe to the channel for lots more videos about Unity's Entity Component System and their data-oriented technology stack. Of course, if you do have any questions for me or suggestions for future videos, you can always leave those down in the comment section below or join us over on Discord. We've got a nice community of ECS developers over there. Just go to tmg.dev slash Discord. I'll see you there. So this random type works very similar to many other random types in computer programming where we basically initialize it with a seed value. Now, when we initialize it with a seed value, basically any time we ask for a new random number, it's going to return a predictable result of random numbers. So let's say we want to generate a random integer between 1 and 100, and then we pass in a seed value of 5 to our random struct. So when we want to request a new random value, then we're going to get the same results every time we run our application. So let's say um, when we request it the first time, we'll get a value of 88. Then we request a new number, and then maybe we get 72. We'll request a new number, and then we'll get 14. Now let's say we close our application, go ahead and run it again. If we initialize the struct with the same seed value of 5, then again, we're going to get the numbers 88, 72, 14 when we request those new random numbers. However, if we were to initialize it with a different seed value, let's say a seed value of 11, Maybe we'd ask for a number between 1 and 100, and then we'd get 36, 84, 26. And so that's basically all there is to this random class as far as the basic interactions go for it. Um, you basically just initialize it with a seed value, and then when you want to request a new value, you basically just call next and then data type. So if we say wanted an integer, we would say, um, you know, our random dot next int. And then every time we call that next int, it's going to return a random integer. And so I should mention that there are all sorts of other different things that we can randomize. You know, we can get random integers, doubles, floats, booleans, uh, quaternion rotations. And a lot of these can actually be defined with a minimum and maximum value. So if we actually don't put anything in, then there's kind of like a default range. It's usually between zero and one. Um, for some things like integers, it's actually between the minimum value and the maximum value. Um, and then we can actually sometimes pass in one parameter where it basically just gives us a random value between zero and then using that parameter as the max value. And then we can actually pass in two parameters so then we can get a random value between the minimum and the maximum. And then if you do want to know a little bit more about how it works behind the scenes, it uses an XOR shift, not an exorcist, but an XOR shift as in an exclusive OR shift, which is basically a way to kind of scramble the bits around in order to produce a new random value. And when we actually initialize the um, random struct with a seed value, it's going to generate behind the scenes what is known as a state value, which is an unsigned integer. And then based, based off of that state value is what we use to calculate the different values between our defined range. And each time a new random value is requested, a new state value is generated. Okay, so the random type that we use in ECS, like I said, it's part of the unity.mathematics library, and it's a struct, so we can easily drop this on any data component that we want. And that's actually the preferred method of using the random struct in ECS is actually giving any data component that we want to basically randomize any values on, give it its own instance of the unity random struct, and then we're going to be using that instance to generate random values. And when we get into the kind of tutorial section, I'll show you some of the pitfalls about um, using maybe one central random thing. But basically the idea is when we kind of jobify things and start multi-threading, when we request a new random value, it doesn't actually write back the random value to the original 
basically instance of that struct. So what actually ends up happening is we get our initial randomized value, but then nothing randomized after that. You know, we keep asking for new random values and we just get the same random value returned every time. Now we can run this on the main thread without the burst compiler and that works just fine. However, that's not necessarily ideal, especially if we're trying to randomize a whole bunch of things in Unity ECS. Okay, so moving over into the Unity setup, basically, again, I'm gonna show you kind of the incorrect way to do this real quickly. Um, so this is where we have kind of like a central random controller. So you can see here, that um, I've set up this just real simple game object with the convert to entity script on it. It also has this central random data authoring script. And you can see what this central random data authoring script looks like. We just have a public random called value. And you'll see up at the top, I have this using random equals the unity.mathematics.random. The reason we do this is because there's like seven different random libraries that we could be using. So we want to specify that we're using the unity.mathematics.random. So in this example, the red capsules are going to be the ones that are getting their values, their random values from that central random controller. You can see basically all they do, they all they have is this convert to entity script on there, as well as a central random tag on here, just so we can um, filter out by that specific tag. All right, and so real quick, this is the incorrect method of doing this, so don't pay attention to it too much. But in the on start running function, we're basically just gonna go ahead and get that singleton for the central random data. We're going to initialize it with a seed value of 10. I'll go into a little more detail when I show you the correct way to implement this. We're just gonna go ahead and log that state value to the screen so we can see what it is. And then whenever we press the R key in the on update function, again, we're just gonna go ahead and print out what that state value is so we can see what it is and if it's changing. And then we're gonna do an entities.withall. So we're filtering out by anything with the central random tag. So that's basically any of the red capsules. And then we'll do a dot for each, getting a reference to the translation component. And then we'll just set the X value of the translation component equal to a random value um, using the dot next float method between a value of zero and 25. So that can basically um, get us anywhere um, on that X axis, um, basically along the width of that plane. And as you can see, we're just doing a schedule parallel here. And then we actually don't necessarily need this set singleton, but I'm showing you that, you know, even after we run this next float function and we call the set singleton, um, it's actually still not gonna update that singleton. And what I mean by that is when I go hit play, you'll see that the internal state is set to a value of 2703690, even though we initialized it with a seed value of 10. Um, so the seed value doesn't necessarily line up with the state value. Now I can go ahead and hit the R key and you'll see that um, we basically get a nice random distribution of all these capsules. And you'll see that the uh, state value is basically still that same number. And then no matter how many times I press the R key, you'll see that nothing changes. When we access the random values in this way, when we're using a scheduled job, there's no way that we can actually write back to that initial random struct. And so that's basically what causes the issues here. Again, we can run this on the main thread without the burst compiler. Of course, we don't get the you know performance advantages that we're looking for, but that is one workaround if for some reason that you absolutely need to uh, use some central random value manager. Okay, so now for the correct way to do this, basically we're gonna be doing this on the green capsules. So we have the individual random capsules, which each have an individual random data authoring on there. So you can see that each one of these capsules has its own random uh, value on it. Of course, we can set the state here in the editor if we want to. Um, however, we're gonna be doing this all through code. And then here's the data component here. As you see, we just have a public random value right here. Uh, we're gonna be adding a little bit more things to it later. So then moving along to the actual individual random system, basically in the on start running, first we're going to initialize the random seed. So basically we're just gonna do an entities dot for each on anything with an individual random data, um, which we'll call random data. So then we can just do a random data dot value dot init state and then we can pass in any value that we want say 120 and then you'll see that in the on update we're basically doing the same thing when i hit the i key i'm just going to manipulate the x value of the translation component again to a random value between 0 and 25 and we are going to schedule it parallelly so I'll go ahead and enter play mode and you'll see when I hit the i key you'll see that the capsules move to a random location and when i press the i key again you see that every time that I press them, they're moving to a new random location. 
However, you're seeing that they're all moving to the same random location. And that's because that we're basically setting them all up with the same seed, which is not exactly what we want. We want this to be a little more random. So there is a way that we can actually implement a unique seed for each of these, and that's by using the entity index. So in order to do that in our entities.foreach function, um, basically the only way that we can get to it is if we first define the uh, entity E, and then we do an int, and then we actually have to name it specifically entity in query index with all that capitalization like that. Um, and then what we can do is inside here, we can pass in the entity in query index, and then we actually have to cast this to an unsigned integer. And then we will move back over to Unity. And then if we hit the play mode, you'll see that we actually end up getting an error. It says that there is an invalid state of zero. Um, I might have mentioned it before, but we actually cannot have a state value of zero. We need to initialize it to a non-zero number. However, when we basically get the entity query index, obviously the first entity in the list is going to be at index zero. So we can't actually use the init state if we're using the entity's index. So what we can do instead is we do uh, random data dot value and we'll set this equal to random dot create from index. So this is a static function built onto the random struct and then in here, we can pass in the entity in query index. And again, we do need to cast this to a uint for unsigned integer. Uh, now we can come back over to Unity and enter play mode. And now when we hit the I key, you'll see that everything is um, just randomly moving all over the place, which is exactly what we want it to do every time I hit the I key. And of course we can randomize more things than just the translation. Maybe if we wanted to uh, say randomize the rotation, we could do a ref to the rotation, we'll just call it ROT. And then we'll say ROT dot value is equal to random data dot value. Uh, dot next quaternion rotation. It's just built right in right there. Um, and we actually don't need to put any parameters in there. So come back over to Unity and we'll hit the I key and you'll see that they're now randomizing on position and rotation every time I hit the I key. So just something cool and simple that you can do. And then real quickly, I'm gonna be showing you a good clean code principle that we can use in order to uh, make it a little bit easier for us to get a good translation value. So for now, I'm just gonna go ahead and remove this line. And I'm actually gonna come back over to the individual random data component here. And then you'll see that I've added in some uh, public fields for minimum position and maximum position. And then I've added in a new property called next position. And I'm just using the um, expression body syntax here. And then we can just do value, which again is just a reference to this random value up here. And then on here, I can just do a next float three, passing in the minimum position and maximum position. And this will just return a random float three. So when I come over to the system, I can just say translation dot value is equal to random data dot next position, just like that. Now I'll come over to Unity, just make sure I set the minimum and maximum position on this data authoring script. Go ahead and hit the play button here, and then we'll press the I key, and then you'll see that it's now um, going over a bunch of random positions, basically just within that minimum and maximum range that I've defined. So again, I think that's really clean, just a nice clean code way of just saying, you know, give me the next position, and then we'll just let the data component deal with um, figuring out what the minimum and maximum values are and we don't need to you know be fumbling around with these inside of a system so anyways that's kind of an overview about how to use the random class in unity's entity component system i hope you did find this video helpful and informative and hopefully maybe it cleared up some issues that you might have had with unity's um, random implementation for ecs so anyways, if you did find today's video helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you hit that like button. Also, feel free to subscribe to the channel for lots more videos about Unity's Entity Component System and their data-oriented technology stack. Of course, if you do have any questions for me or suggestions for future videos, you can always leave those down in the comment section below. Come join us over on Discord over at tmg.dev Discord. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next one.